Well, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for coming. Uh, my name is Dave Copeland, or DaveTron5000 on Twitter, and I'm gonna talk about how to be an effective remote developer, I hope. Uh, so I spent the last four and a half years as a remote developer. I was one of the first engineers at Stitch Fix. Uh, we're a personal styling service for men's and women's clothes. And when I started, uh, we were very small, you know, scrappy startup kind of thing. And, you know, I was uh, just writing code as one does in that situation. Uh, but uh, due to the way we work at Stitch Fix and over time, uh, my role has also changed. So I was a tech lead of a small team and now I'm a manager of several different teams. And so I've worked with a lot of different people than just developers. Certainly I work with a lot of developers, but I work with uh, people who use our software, um, the business people who run Stitch Fix, uh, vendors that we rely on, uh, all remote for that entire time. Uh, and that's pretty typical of a, of a developer at Stitch Fix. We now have over 70 engineers, and most of the engineering work at Stitch Fix is done remotely. Uh, over half the engineers don't live in the Bay Area. We're headquartered in San Francisco, but most engineers don't live there. Those that do live in the Bay Area certainly come to the office, but they don't necessarily come in every day. So there's a lot of remote work happening. So what does that mean, remote, though? When I was thinking about this, uh, it occurred to me that people work remotely a lot more than uh, you might think, um, if you think about what that means. So I tried to describe it. Bear with me. You do not often interact face-to-face -face with the people you work with. It's not a great sentence. I tried very hard to make a better one, but I think this gets the point across, right? You go somewhere and do work. Maybe that somewhere is a coffee shop. Maybe that's um, your basement. Uh, and you work with people, and those people aren't there uh, most of the time, right? So that's the situation uh, that I mean by remote. And if you think about it like that, like there's a lot of remote work happening uh, in the world, not just, uh, not just with developers. So there's the lone wolf, right? Uh, this is the hard mode of remote where you are by yourself and everyone else you work with is at some other office. Uh, tricky, but what we're gonna talk about in this talk applies to the lone wolf. Uh, you also have easy mode, which is everybody is distributed. No, no one goes to an office, there is no office, everyone just sort of works whenever, wherever. Um, that's a little easier, but still the same things apply that we'll talk about. Uh, but think about multiple offices. Like you could go to an office every day have a commute, go to a desk with your computer and all that entails, but the people you work with aren't in that office. You're a remote developer because you're working with people who aren't there. So that's what I mean by remote. Uh, so we also have to talk about what is effective. So uh, obviously producing some value, right? Your company's paying you to do a thing uh, and you need to do that thing. So that's part of it. Uh, but for you, you also wanna be working on something valuable, right? You wanna make sure that you're working on the right things, uh, that those, thing, those things are useful. Uh, and that people want them or get some sort of benefit out of them. You also wanna have some level of agency, right? You don't want your job to just be closing Jira tickets all the time. Like you wanna have some broader effect on the team, the people you work with, the company, something like that that's not just doing the task in front of you but growing as a person and you need agency and impact in order to do that. You wanna feel included, right? you wanna feel like part of the team. You don't wanna be, again, the person whose job is just to close Jira tickets. You wanna be part of the group moving forward on a, a collective goal. And you want the experience to be rewarding, right? No one wants their job to not be rewarding, and to the extent that having to have a job uh, is a necessity, you want it to be as rewarding as it can be. Um, now, I don't want to imply that you get these things for free just because you go to some office, but you get some of these things for free just by going to an office. Like, there is this sort of implicit uh, level of effectiveness that you can just get for free by being with everyone that you work with. So what it means is to achieve these things when you're remote, you have to just work a little harder and you have to be more intentional in your behavior to make sure that stuff happens. And that's what we're gonna, that's what we're gonna talk about. There's not a week that goes by that I don't think about the remote experience that I have or that the people I work with have. Um, and it does require constant upkeep and it is not what I would call easy. Um, it's not impossible, obviously, um, but it does. It is, it is a part of like my job to work on this and make sure that the behavior that I'm exhibiting is doing the best to make the remote experience good. Um, of course, it's worth it. Uh, who who works remote most of the time? Okay, all right. So you know, you know what I'm talking about. It's totally worth it because you get this level of freedom and flexibility that you don't get by having to go to an office. Right? I don't have to commute anywhere at, at all. Uh, I can make lunch in my kitchen. My kitchen is in fact stock stocked with these snacks that I prefer, and I don't have to stock other people's snacks. Um, I can work outside if it's nice. Uh, I don't have to use a public bathroom. Uh, but the best, part about, uh, the best part about working remote is I don't have to live in San Francisco. I love, love not living in San Francisco. It's my favorite thing. No offense to San Francisco, but I don't wanna live there. 
Now, the company gets a benefit from this, too. The company, I'm sure, is very happy that I get to make lunch at home, but really, the company gets access to a wider pool of talent, so that's why they are also willing to uh, spend the time on this sort of thing. So if Stitch Fix had decided that every engineer had to come to some office in San Francisco, it would have taken us much longer to build the team that we have, it would have been harder to build the type of team that we have, uh, and it would have actually had a significant impact on the company's growth. Um, and because we committed early on to making the remote thing work, we are able to uh, get people from all over the place. I'm not sure if you are aware of this, but um, there are developers who are really awesome and they don't live in San Francisco. There's a few of them, so uh, we've got a lot of them on our team, and it's awesome. Um, so this is how we do that. So it's not technical, I'm not gonna talk about Slack uh, or, or anything like that. Uh, you have to spend your energy building trust with people that you don't know and maintaining trust with people that you do know, and you have to be constantly doing this. So that's what we're gonna talk about. Behaviors that you can take in a very small way that contribute to building trust with other people and acknowledging that trust. Anyone ever heard this phrase, the half-life of trust is six weeks? So uh, there's a tiny link there that you shouldn't bother with. You can go to the slides later. Uh, it's a blog post by Steve McConnell. Steve McConnell's a, a author of software books. He wrote Code Complete. Uh, and in, in the blog post, he talks about his frustration working with a team located in India, which is halfway across the world from where he was. Um, and he, he recounts one of his managers saying this phrase, the half-life of trust is six weeks, which sort of implies that if you take no action, if you don't do things to reinforce and replenish that trust, it's going to go away. And when you're not present with people, it goes away much more quickly because you don't see them. Like, you get a lot of trust by default by just being around people. And as a remote developer, you're not around people. Uh, and so you have to work extra hard to make sure that the trust that you've earned continues and that you're building more trust and, and, and just replenishing that constantly. So um, I've got four mindsets that you can use to drive your behavior that I believe will uh, build and maintain trust with other people. And we're gonna talk about those uh, with respect to all the different things that we do as developers. They are communicate frequently and clearly, uh, be responsive but set boundaries, Assume good intentions and help others help you. So the theme here is that you have the power to make your remote experience good, and we're gonna talk about things that you can do to do that. But we do have to have a brief chat about technology. Uh, so the biggest problem with being remote in terms of communication and building trust is, like I said, you're not actually there. Uh, so you don't have the ability to go over to someone's desk and talk to them. You, you have to go through some piece of technology to be able to just communicate with them. And so you're gonna need a few set up, uh, you're gonna need some sort of chat system that people can use and that they check and that they're in. And I said the word people, not developers, right? So it's gotta be something that every person that you need to interact with is gonna be able to deal with. IRC is not that thing, I'm sorry. Uh, you're gonna need a video conferencing system that accommodates multiple people uh, and that they can use easily. And again, this is people, not developers. They should be able to include meetings and calendar invites. They should be able to uh, connect them to room systems or other things like that. Uh, they should be able to uh, get in and out of them very easily. Uh, so WebEx, anyone like WebEx? Anyone love WebEx, right? No, uh, WebEx meets this standard even though it is terrible. So again, the bar is low, you just have to have it there. And if you don't have these things, the entire thing is very difficult. It's also not very interesting to talk about because you just sort of need to pay money and get them set up. And I don't want to trivialize that, but that just needs to happen. Uh, you also need a non-shitty microphone. So people's, <laughs> people's experience of you, <laughs> yes, those of us who have dealt with shitty microphones, uh, people's experience of you in real time is mostly going to be talking over a video conferencing system, which is uh, very terrible because all that that entails. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not the same as talking to a person uh, you know, face to face, and you can't control the crappy internet and terrible software that's involved, but you can control the input to that, which is your microphone. So your laptop mic is shitty, I'm sorry if you feel otherwise, but it is. Uh, Apple earbuds are perfectly fine, right? You don't need an amazing $4,000 ribbon microphone, you just need something that works and is near your mouth, and Apple earbuds work. So, technology over. Back to the harder part, which is building and maintaining trust. Uh, so um, we, uh, I outline these kind of four mindsets. So I want to talk about the kinds of behaviors that they could drive when you're doing different things that are part of your job. So we code, right, mostly. Hopefully we're coding most of the time. That's the output of our work. Uh, we communicate asynchronously, like with an email. We communicate synchronously, like on a video chat. Uh, and we socialize. So we'll talk about each of those four things as we go. Coding first, right? Coding, that's a thing you're hired to do. That is uh, the thing that makes you a developer and not someone else. Uh, this is probably what you're spending most of your time doing, and this is your work product. 
So how do we communicate when we're coding? So think about what, it, what it's like to walk into a room with a bunch of developers. Like, what do you see? You see people typing on a keyboard into a black rectangle with white text on it, and maybe they're working, maybe they're not, but they sure look like they're working. And, and just that visual image uh, is actually important, and, and people will assume, well, the developers look like they're developing because they're typing into rectangles. Uh, when you're remote, <laughs> you don't have that at all. So uh, y you know, to build trust, you need to produce things. And so um, a way to do that, which is also a great way to write code in general, is to turn larger projects into smaller ones. Find a way to take whatever your problem is and get parts of it in front of other people quickly, whatever your process is. Um, this lets people, uh, first of all, a small change is easy to understand, a large change is not, and so when people see you produce a small change, they're gonna see that frequently and they're gonna be able to understand it and give you feedback on it, uh, and that lets them understand you better, and that also shows that you are producing stuff and you're driving uh, towards a result, and that builds trust because they can see that you're actually doing something. Um, when you're making changes, think about what is the smallest viable change, right? Because you have to think about it, not just am I getting the code to work, but can someone understand what I've done so they can give me the feedback that I need to know if it's good, so they can say yes, this can go to production. You wanna optimize the way you work so that people can understand that because you're not necessarily gonna have another way to talk to them. They, the only communication you might have is the change request, whatever form that takes. So if you're thinking about redoing the test because they're not RSpec enough, don't do that. If you're thinking about refactoring this ugly code that you don't like, don't do that. If you're thinking about fixing some white space because it offends your sensibilities, don't do that. I've done all those things and it does not help communication at all. When you are submitting your change request, however you do that, so at Stitch Fix we make pull requests to GitHub, whatever your process is, you're presumably gonna have to write something to explain what you've done. Um, write more about it than you might think you should. Um, because again, you're optimizing for people to understand what you've produced, and so you need to give them some clue as to what they're looking at and why they need to look at it and what you want them to look at. So when I do this, I try every time to write the word problem and hit return, and I type a sentence or two about like what I'm trying to accomplish. And I hit return, and I type solution, and I hit return again, and I write some couple of sentences about how I approached it, what I, what I tried to do, to give somebody a chance at understanding what I've done, because that might be the only chance they get to understand what I've done. Uh, more practically speaking, learn how to screencast and diagram. Um, so early on at Stitch Fix, uh, I was working on software, and there wasn't an easy way to share it with anyone. Uh, there wasn't really a staging server that anyone could feasibly use, and I'm not there to bring my laptop over to show it to someone. So I would just run the app on my, uh, on my laptop and screencast and just talk over using the app in my development environment. And that is way easier to explain what you're doing than typing a bunch of stuff out. Uh, I use this thing called Jing. Uh, it's free for five minutes or less. You can share the screencast privately. If you just get really good at doing that quickly, then this is a thing you can just do without friction and include. Diagrams the same way. Um, just buy OmniGraffle and learn the keyboard shortcuts and then you will make diagrams very quickly and easily and then that is a thing you can bring to better communicate with people. Being responsive and setting boundaries. So the first boundary you need to set is your working hours especially when there's time zones, right? I mean, does anyone like time zone math? Because talk to non-developers. They don't even know what it is. They're not gonna do it. Uh, so you need to help them. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to do this, and you have to take a, a, a wide approach. So I set in my calendar what my working hours are. Uh, I include my time zone in my email signature, and then when people are interacting with me, I am try to be nice about when my working hours are. So if someone schedules a meeting with me at like six o'clock, I say, hey, that's a little bit late for me. I don't know if you know this, I'm on the East Coast. Can we do this later, right? It's a very nice way to kind of set some boundaries without being a jerk. Or if someone's giving me feedback or I'm chatting with someone, I might have to say, hey, it's the end of my day. I gotta take off. Let's pick this up in the morning, right? So, but you do need to set those boundaries because people aren't gonna know, and they need to know. So when you're uh, asking for feedback, right, when you're writing your code and you're like, this is done, I'm ready, what, are, what is the next step? Someone has to like say, yeah, cool, or whatever the, whatever the process is, you're kind of watching for feedback. And so the second you do that, your job then becomes to respond to that feedback. Uh, why? First of all, it shows that you're engaged and that you're trying to drive completion, which builds trust because people like people that drive to completion. Uh, but it also allows you to capitalize on the context that people develop by giving you feedback. If someone like reads your pull request and gives you feedback, and then you don't respond to it for a couple of days, well, they've forgotten whatever they looked at and they have to go relearn it again if they're gonna engage with you. But if you do it quickly uh, and you engage with them back and forth, then you're making everything better. And what I've learned is you need to develop a workflow that does not put you heads down away from all forms of communication for hours at a time. And this is really hard because sometimes the developers 
we need to do this. But the more you are uh, uh, not able to be contacted, right, people can't walk over to you. So they have no way to contact you except for the avenues that you have set up and created, and if you're not responsive to them, then they can't take advantage of your expertise, and that is gonna drive you more towards the JIRA ticket closer and, and, and not closer to a uh, full rounded developer who has agency and impact and is growing the team and growing themselves. So I, I, I will happily tell you my crazy workflow that I do for this, it might not work for you, uh, but the gist of it is I have an SLA for all forms of communication, and I try to stick to that, and I have a way that while I'm working, I can check all of the forms of communication to see if I need to do anything without forgetting my spot. Whatever works for you, try to find some way to do that. And the more you do build up trust, though, the more you can kind of get away with being uh, offline for a little while. So this could be a thing where early on you need to focus on being more responsive, and as you kind of build up trust with people, you can, you can take more time to do this stuff. This is hard to do, it's, it's, it's very hard. Uh, assume good intentions. Uh, so code review comments. Anyone like getting their code commented on? Is that, is that a fun experience? Okay, uh, yeah, it's very harsh. Uh, we as an industry aren't used to critiquing each other, we're not used to being critiqued, we're not good at it uh, on either end, uh, and so it can be hard to, hard to accept. Uh, and also people are, are bad at it, and it can often come off mean, or you can read a tone into it that is unpleasant, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not good. Uh, but you have to assume, the only way to deal with this is to assume that the reviewer, whoever's telling you stuff about your code, they're just trying to help. Uh, they're trying to help make your code better, make you better, make the company better, whatever it is, they're trying to help or they wouldn't bother commenting. I'm not saying to tolerate bad behavior, but bad behavior is a pattern that you can observe. One time thing, uh, you have to assume good intentions, otherwise you'll go crazy. Now a way to deal with this problem uh, is leads to helping others help you. Not everyone is good at it, like I said, but some people are exceptionally good at just talking. So uh, if you're having a, an interaction um, in text that is not working, then jump to video. Like, uh, this is my failure mode all the time, is I never uh, go to video. But if you go to where someone communicates well, then you will have good communication with them, right? It kind of, right, stands to reason. Um, and instead of making people come to you. You should also be specific in the feedback that you want. If you put up a pull request and say thoughts, you're not likely to encourage good feedback. So if you actually, um, specify like what, what are the areas of your code that you want someone to like look at? Like, oh, this variable name, I had a hard time coming up with it, I don't know, does this make sense? Or uh, does, does, this, does this method like make any sense? Can someone sort of like help me understand, does this look right? Um, so that does several things. One, it lets people like quickly figure out what to do and can more easily engage with you, which means that you will engage with them and you know, that kind of builds trust. But it also shows a little bit of vulnerability, which is huge for building trust because it shows that you're willing to acknowledge areas of your code that aren't perfect, and so then when people interact with you, they know that they're getting an honest and authentic experience because you're willing to call out things that aren't perfect. Okay, code. Asynchronous communication, so all this coding stuff is a form of asynchronous communication, it's very specific to our, uh, to our profession, but you're also gonna interact with people not about code, writing emails, uh, sharing documents, um, texting in Slack or something like that, there's all kinds of uh, asynchronous communication, and this is the primary way you're gonna communicate with most people, um, just by nature of being remote. Fortunately, this is a little easier uh, to deal with, so communicating frequently and clearly. You have to provide more context. So when you're talking to somebody, you can see their eyes start to glaze over, you can see them get confused, they can raise their hand, they can interrupt you uh, if, you're, if you're not like making a point, but in an email or a document, like you're not gonna get that, you might never know if someone understood an email that you sent. So you need to provide a little bit more context to increase the chance that they are going to understand that. So uh, explicitly state what problem you're trying to solve or what information you want or what you want them to do and why give some more backstory so that there's a chance that they uh, get what you mean. Um, you should also become a better writer because you're gonna be writing a lot. Uh, and this is how to do that. Uh, so you, you write something you want someone to read. The least you can do is read it yourself first. Uh, and when you do that, you find all kinds of mistakes in your writing. You find all kinds of incorrect words and other things. So uh, everything that I write, I read at least once and I revise at least once because there's always a way to make it better. And I just do this all the time. And uh, as you do this more and more, you make a habit out of this, then uh, you will do it frequently and the more important an email might be or whoever you're sending it to, you will revise more and more. Uh, and it just makes you uh, more effective at communication when you're sort of at least taking it for a dry run. Uh, typography matters. 
A wall of text is impossible to understand. Like hit return a few times, make some paragraphs at least. Every few sentences there should be a paragraph or something. Um, but bold, italics, underline, like those exist, they have meaning, you should use those. Um, bullet lists, I mean it's stupid to say any of this, but I remember in my youth, every email was just nothing but courier text wrapped at 80 characters and if people wanted bold, then that was their problem, right? That is not the way to effectively communicate. Uh, again, the diagramming thing is really helpful, especially when you're communicating um, to uh, outside developers or people who are not good at processing text, which is lots of people. Uh, Make it, learn how to make diagrams quickly and efficiently, and that's a tool that you can bring to bear and make things more clear. Being responsive. So a lot of the things we talked about with code kind of apply here. Um, the point is you wanna engage, give feedback if you're being asked for it, ask for feedback if you want it, like engage, show that you're interested in helping someone solve their problem. Because when you do this, this is how you get agency and this is how you have an impact, right? And this is why being responsive is so important. Uh, you have an opinion about things. And if you don't share that opinion with anyone, then that opinion is not going to affect anything. It's just an opinion that you have. But if you share your opinion with people, then that is a chance for you to affect how things are. Uh, and if your opinions are good and they are helpful, then you will be seen as someone who is good and helpful. And that, is, uh, that means people will trust your opinion and trust you and come to you and ask you for things and give you more of an impact on what you do. And that makes a much better work experience. So being responsive and helping people out uh, is is good. But don't forget affirming feedback. So all of the stuff we've been talking about about feedback is like critiques, this is wrong, fix this, blah, blah, blah. It's very easy to get wrapped up in that. And we do want those. That is the critique that we want because we want to be better. But it is nice when someone tells you that a thing you did is good. And it's even nicer when they say it in a, in a very detailed way. So if you say, oh, that API design looks good. I mean, that's nice, that's very nice. But if you say, um, the, uh, the, the names you're using in the route map exactly to the domain, which makes it really easy for me to understand. This, this whole thing is like really simple. I, thanks for putting this together. That is really great to hear because it shows that you've understood what they've done uh, and that you took the time to say something nice. And it's, if you're a person that says nice things to people and makes them feel good, that builds trust. Uh, so I used to think affirming feedback was pointless. It is not pointless. It is very, very pointful. Assume good intentions. So uh, a lot of asynchronous communication you have as a developer will be with non-developers. Uh, sometimes there are people that use ask as a noun or use solution as a verb. And if you're like me, it drives you completely insane. Um, but the point is, uh, that's just a communication style. It's not an indicator of ability. So I choose, and this is hard, but I choose to assume that everyone I interact with is killing it at their job, that they're really good at their job. Because that mindset is the only way to deal with, with other people, otherwise you get wrapped up in communication style. I mean, the number of PowerPoints that I have had to have a conversation about in the last four years is kind of staggering, but that's how some people communicate, and that's cool, because they're good at their job, and that's fine. Help others help you. So again, kind of same deal. Ask for the feedback that you want. Um, the other cool thing about this is this is another avenue to give context to help people understand what you're doing. If you're telling them what you want, that helps them figure out what it is you're trying to accomplish and is uh, much more likely to garner uh, some back and forth. So this is the hard, and for me anyway, this is the hardest part is synchronous communication, which basically means being on some sort of uh, video conferencing system. Um, why? I mean, part of it is I'm an introvert and so this saps my energy to have conversations. Um, but another part of it is that it's this weird, uncanny valley version of having a conversation with a real person, right? Because you can see them and you can hear them, but everything between you and them is terrible software that barely works and the whole thing is just awful. And so it's just more stressful to have to deal with this. But some conversations cannot happen over text. Like um, you, ha you have to have synchronous conversations sometimes. Um, so how do we deal with this? Be prepared. Uh, so I find um, if I'm expected to like say words to people, uh, the more confident I am in the, in the subject matter, the more likely I am to say something that makes sense. So uh, read the material before the meeting. Uh, see who's there. What is the meeting about? Do you have an opinion about what we're going to discuss? If so, formulate that opinion in your mind um, in, at some level of detail. So if you have to say something, it will uh, make sense and people will get it. Uh, you should also try to speak with more nouns than pronouns. When you say stuff like he, she, it, they, this, that, thing, thing's not a pronoun, but you know what I mean, those words don't mean anything. Who knows what that means? The only way you can know is if someone said a noun before and you, have, you can guess that that noun is the thing that that means and okay, now I get what you're saying. And when you're talking to a person like 
face to face, you can see them get confused and be like, ah, okay, sorry, but this is what I meant, blah, blah, blah. When you're on a video, you can't see that. Also, due to technology, uh, you will not be heard. Everything you say is not going to be heard. If someone coughs, uh, a word is going to drop out. Two people start talking, there's crosstalk, people aren't going to hear what you say. Uh, the internet drops for a microsecond and one word goes. I've, I've been on video chats where I missed the noun because of technology, and then for two minutes, people were discussing, and they never used a noun, and I, didn't, I literally couldn't figure out what they were talking about. And I had to interrupt and say, what is the noun, please? I don't know what this means. I'm sorry, you've got to tell me. Uh, so when you do that, that means that the things that people do here, they're more likely to know what you're talking about. Um, a better way is to pause frequently and ask for feedback, right? Because people can't interrupt. Interrupting on video is very hard. People aren't necessarily going to do it, so take a moment. Okay. Uh, this is my um, proposal for how we're gonna do this JSON thing. Does that make sense, everybody? And then you have this like pause. Um, when we do our uh, all hands engineering meetings at Stitch Fix, like, you know, I say, like I said, a lot of us are remote, and our CTO is really good at doing this. So she'll give us information, and then she will pause and say, anybody have any questions? And then if nobody in the office has questions, she will always say, anybody on the phone have any questions? And then pause for a very uncomfortable amount of time because she knows that it takes a while for us to Oh, do I have a question? I do have a question. Let me ask that question. Like, that takes a while. And so she puts those pauses in there so that nobody has to interrupt and everyone has a chance to participate. So when you're speaking, you should do that. Being responsive and setting boundaries. This is kind of the other end of this. And this is the, for me, this is the absolute hardest part to not multitask. So uh, if you are in um, a conference room with people and you're on your phone or you're on your laptop, like, that's very rude. And so you wouldn't do that, because social norms say, I got invited to a meeting, I should pay attention to the meeting, I shouldn't be on my phone. But when you're on a video conference, you're literally on your computer, and stuff is popping up, and you can check email and Slack, and you can do these things. You can, you can tell yourself that you can multitask, but you're not really paying attention, and then either you miss things that are important, or you get called out. I have definitely been asked questions in meetings where I had no idea what to say, and I just had to cop to it. I'm sorry, I was multitasking. Please, please repeat the question. That's super embarrassing. Um, when you do have something to say, uh, it is very awkward to jump in, but sometimes you're gonna have to, and because of all the delays that happen, uh, you may have to ask the group to backtrack and you know, just be upfront about it. Hey, I'm sorry to just jump in here real quick, but that can we go back for a second? I had this thing, this comment, like, it's hard to do this. Some people just can't. I have a hard time, not as hard as others. Um, the pausing thing that I talked about, if others are doing that, that helps. And when you do have the floor, that is your time to set an example on explicitly calling on other people, uh, especially people that you know are not gonna be comfortable jumping in, but you know have an opinion. That is a really good technique. Oh, uh, Chris, you just did this thing. What's your thoughts, right? Or anyone on the phone else have something before we move on? That's, that's how these meetings should be run, and so you have to set that example whenever you can. Uh, no one's gonna know that the AV is a problem but you. Um, this is like when someone has uh, something on their teeth. You just have to tell them because no one's going, they're not going to know. So you have to be comfortable pointing it out. Uh, it sucks, but um, that is a fact of life. And of course, you have to be self-aware. These behaviors that I'm describing that kind of have to exist on some level are jerky behaviors if they're done too much or too frequently or too aggressively. Uh, and so you need to have a lot of self-awareness when you do this, uh, sometimes even asking um, people for feedback when you're offline to say, hey, I'm sorry, I kept interrupting you. I'm really not trying to talk over you, but maybe I was, like, uh, give me your feedback on how that went so I can, I can get better. Like, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely, definitely hard. Um, and that sort of follows on assuming good intentions, right, because people are gonna interrupt you, and it's gonna seem jerky, and you have to assume that they're just trying to deal with the technology. Um, the other thing, though, is that the people who are uh, maybe not remote who are part of this, who are in this mythical conference room, they're not having a great time with the video chat either. Like, it's not great for them to have all of this stuff going on, and it is friction for them, and having some empathy for them is really helpful because uh, it just kind of, it's actually something that you all can bond over. I complain about the technology all the time, and it's kind of can lighten the mood sometimes, right? Because computers are terrible. Like, you have to rely on all of these servers and all these pieces of technology, and they all barely work. I'm amazed it works at all. Uh, they don't work consistently. Uh, it's just all just terrible. Um, and acknowledging that can uh, make everyone sort of like feel a little bit better about getting through the video conferences. Uh, helping others help you. So I mentioned before about the, the AV system issues. This will definitely happen. And you need to kind of channel your inner wedding coordinator and just tell people what they need to do because they're not going to know. 
uh, hey, point the laptop at Pat because Pat is the one who's speaking, right? Like, just tell people what to do. They're happy to fix it, but they're not going to know because they're not experiencing the AV the same way that you are. If you can recruit an ally uh, or, or have a, a blessed back channel, that is really helpful too. So at Stitch Fix, we do company all hands meetings. And as I mentioned, you know, a lot of developers are remote, but there's a lot of other remote people. We have lots of different offices. Our stylists are remote. People are traveling. So remote is a big part of our uh, all hands meetings. And um, uh, there's a wonderful person on our ops team who monitors the back channel. And she asks questions for us. And she fixes AV problems. And we can handle this all by chatting and not interrupting uh, the meeting. So if you have an ally, that is super helpful. OK, socializing. Why are we talking about socializing? When you go to an office, people know things about you. Even if you're the most private person in the world and you never say anything to anyone, people will know like, what kind of clothes you wear, what your hair looks like, how tall you are, what time of the day you come into work, how often you go to the bathroom. These are banal, silly things, but people will know them about you. And if you are not going to an office, they will know absolutely nothing about you. Um, I'm amazed at the height of my coworkers when I first meet them. It's, it's not what I expect, ever. Um, so uh, what this means, sadly, for the introverts is you're going to have to make small talk. Uh, you have no other way to interact with people. And you know, when you're on these video conferences, uh, especially with the West Coast, people are going to be late. And so you have a lot of time to kill while you're waiting for everyone to find the conference room and get there. So make small talk. It sucks. But uh, you can talk about the weather. Uh, and it, it, it's the beginning of a conversation, a beginning of a personal connection. right? For me, it's easy because I live in DC where we have weather. San Francisco, they don't have weather. So it's always an evergreen topic. <laughs> uh, eh, yeah. Um, another thing that we do is uh, we do one-on-ones with people that aren't our manager or aren't our uh, direct report or anything like that with no particular agenda. So I have a lot of one-on-ones with people where, yeah, we'll talk about work sometimes. But we'll also just sort of chit-chat. And sometimes it's just five minutes. But it's a time set aside uh, to interact as people as best as we can. And it feels awkward to schedule these sorts of things. But it's the only way to make them happen. And it, it feels normal after a little while. Being responsive and setting boundaries. So uh, this is more about travel. So getting together with people helps replenish this trust a lot. It, it is really handy if you can do it. Um, travel is a pain, so you want to make sure you understand like what are the expectations, uh, hopefully before you take the job. Uh, and I guess I'm saying this because you might not be told what the expectations are, because it might not occur to someone that travel is difficult for you or something like that. So be clear about what the expectation is. And try to do it when you can. I mean, a lot of us. Um, work remotely because travel is difficult, or we want the flexibility to run our lives in a certain way, and travel sort of disrupts all that. Uh, it's totally true, and definitely set boundaries, but if you can travel, it is worth it to reestablish those bonds with the people that you work with every day, because you, you do b refresh that trust by seeing people in person. Assume good intentions. Right, so people are going to make small talk with you, too, because they're going to want to know who you are, um, and they might ask things that, that are uncomfortable. And they're not trying to be nosy. They just want to get to know who you are. Uh, if you have things about your personal life that you don't want to talk about, that's totally normal and totally cool. But that's all the more reason to do that whole small talk thing. If you're driving the chit chats, then you can drive it in the direction uh, that is safe for everyone. Uh, and just you know, be OK missing social events like happy hours. Uh, my, my respect and admiration for my coworkers is not derived by the number of beers I have shared with them. Uh, it is by the good work that we do. That is the mindset I take. And so therefore, I don't care if I miss uh, happy hours or social events. I, I enjoy them when I can make them. Uh, and it is nice to have a beer with my coworkers. But many of them I've never socialized with at all. And, and it's, they're still great people that I love to work with. So you just have to sort of, sort of be cool with it. Um, but it doesn't mean you can't socialize uh, at all, or you have to miss everything. What it kind of means is that it might not be clear uh, what those things are. And if you have ideas, uh, bring them up. Like You'd be amazed at how successful you can be by bringing your boss an idea that requires your boss to do absolutely nothing but say yes. You do that, you're good. Um, but it does mean you've got to you know, kind of t take the initiative there. If you can find a way to have in-person meetups, be creative about it. There's a couple of developers who live uh, on either sides of our Dallas warehouse. And every once in a while, they will go to the Dallas warehouse and work together. They don't work on the same project, but it, you know, they get to see each other in person and have a little social interaction. So be, you know, be creative and bring them up and suggest them. And often, uh, your boss will be happy that you're helping to figure this problem out, because they're not going to know how to, how to make the experience good for you. Right? So all of that. Uh, are tiny little things that all build little bits of trust between you and others. And when you're trusted, 
uh, and you work with people that you trust, you are gonna be way more effective at your job, way happier, uh, you're gonna have much more agency, you're gonna be producing much more value, you're gonna feel included, and uh, the whole experience is gonna be much more rewarding. Uh, so that's it, these are the four mindsets again, communicate frequently and clearly, be responsive but set boundaries, assume good intentions, and help others help you. Uh, I have just kind of described how things are in my company, and so you should come work for us, or you can, or just talk to us, and we'll tell you how this is, and uh, we can give you all kinds of details on how this stuff works for us. Um, and then that other link is for these slides that you can check out if you like. So thank you. <laughs>